All right. Colonial life. Okay, so last time we talked about uh, the early colonies and how the British, French, Dutch, etc., Portuguese, Spanish started to set up colonies in the New World and other parts of the world too, like Asia um, and India and Southeast Asia, um, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, now we're going to look at like what life was like a little bit in those colonies. And it's a huge topic because it spans hundreds of years, but we're going to focus in on just major features. And specifically, um, we're going to look at the Spanish, the British, and the Chinese, and actually Spanish and British colonies, and also um, not so much Chinese colonies, but uh, uh, what Europeans were doing in China, how they were interacting with China. And with the British, we're going to talk especially about British India, which is huge, and uh, British North America, the colonies that later became the United States. Okay. Um, last time we mentioned the French and Canada and all that, we'll talk a little bit about that and the Dutch, et cetera, but, um, the Portuguese, but we can't do everything in this time. So we just focus mainly on these, these groups. Um, the general pattern, we're going to talk about at the very beginning, and then we'll see the specifics later with triangular trade. So triangular trade is basically three groups, Europeans. Uh, the New World colonies, for example, in North America and Latin America, and then Africa over here. Okay, so what's the triangle? Well, th these are both showing the same thing, except this one's kind of general on the left, and this one's sort of specific on the right. So in general, uh, the colonies were used for primarily raw materials, you know, like the basic stuff like tobacco or corn or cotton or something like that, or wood, fish. And then uh, from Africa, they would bring enslaved people to help produce those raw materials on the plantations, the sugar, the, the cotton. And then Europe's role uh, was mostly to produce manufactured things that were higher value. So they would take the raw materials from here, bring them over to Europe. And then, for example, cotton from the U.S. South, you know, cotton was very big, tobacco and cotton. And they would bring it to Europe and they would, uh, especially Britain at the beginning, and they would make shirts out of it, make like nice shirts and then send them back and sell them back their own cotton, except now as a shirt. And they were the only ones allowed to do that. We'll see in a, in a second under the mercantilist system. In other words, the colonies could never produce their own shirts and then sell them to the world. It was illegal. They could make their own shirts for themselves, but not, not for export. Okay, so it was like very unequal. The colonies were not able to manufacture things and then put them on the global market on the oceans. Okay, that was a, a big problem actually for the colonies. Um, same thing with tobacco. So if you made tobacco, see here, and that tobacco, you couldn't actually make it into finished tobacco for to sell to the world, right? You could make your own tobacco, but You'd have to send that tobacco to England, actually specifically like Scotland became the major tobacco center, which is part of the Britain. And they would refine it and turn it in, you know, put it in bags and cigars and stuff like that. And they would send it around the world for pipes, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so the Europeans held like a monopoly on the higher end stuff. And there's a name for that. That's called the mercantilist system, mercantilist system, like a merchant, you know, somebody buying and selling. And the general idea is that it's, it's like a lopsided approach to trade where you want to, so here's the, here's the mother colonies, the mother, the mother countries here, right? So Britain, France, et cetera. The idea is that the colony's purpose is to feed them, right? To make them rich. <laughs> That's why she's big and everyone else is skinny, right? So in other words, the purpose of the colonies is not just like ancient Greek colonies, just to move some people and have another, another version of Athens, another version of Sparta. It's not that. It's to get resources from them, see gold and silver, food, et cetera, et cetera, and then bring those resources to the mother country to enrich them, okay, uh, to build their bank accounts. Whoops. And so you see over here on the left, here's the colonies and here's the mother country. And so the colonies are given all the raw materials, including gold and silver, but also the, the wood and the food and everything, the cotton. The mother country is making the finished products, the manufactured goods, and then selling those back at a high price. Okay. And 
you might, again, you might wonder, well, why don't the colonies just make that stuff themselves? And the answer is because they're not allowed to under the system, not allowed to. Okay, that's, that's the unequal rules. So sum it up, the point of mercantilism is to export as much as possible, meaning the highest value of goods. Not necessarily the highest volume, but the highest value, highest price. Export that and import as little as possible in terms of the value of the goods. Okay, so import low-end stuff like cotton and corn, export high-end stuff like cigars and shirts. You know, that's called the mercantilist system. And that's how the colonies all ran for a long time on that system, that the goal was to enrich the mother country. Um, now, let's skip ahead. Towards the, towards the end of this period, or the, the, the high period, I guess, of it, uh, the very famous book, the landmark book, it was actually written in the same year of the American Revolution, 1776. And it's by a British author named Adam Smith, okay? And it's called The Wealth of Nations. Um, he's sometimes considered to be the father of modern economics, okay, Adam Smith. And this book, um, remember this, the mercantilist system, you could say that the, the royalty, like the kings and queens, they were running the country's business. Like if the country is a business, they were running the business. You know, the people who were uh, kings and queens at that time. There were no countries with like democracies yet at this time. And he said, actually, you know what? It's better to not do that. It's better to not have kings and queens run the economy because why would they be good at that, right? He said, what, what, what expertise does a king have in running a business more than the people who actually do it on the ground, right? The people who actually make bread and make, um, you know, the fishermen, these guys, they know how to sell fish. They know what the price that should be, right? Things like that. So his book set off a whole school of economics. They call laissez-faire economics, which means to leave it alone. Right, just leave, let the people work out their own prices and deals and stuff like that. Don't have the government intervene. And famously, he has this idea that, you know, because people might say, well, what's going to happen if you do that? You know, you're not going to have any central coordinator, any king or queen or anybody like arranging everything. Wouldn't, wouldn't it all fall apart if you do that? Wouldn't the whole economy be in chaos? And he says, no, actually, it's just the opposite. What's going to happen is there's going to be a natural sort of invisible hand is the metaphor. See the big hand here? And the just the each if each person just follows their own self-interest, right? If the guy making, you know, logging wood or whatever just does his own self-interest, he follows that, right? Sells it at a price that people want, etc. If the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker, all the guys who make stuff, if they just follow their own self-interest, which is to produce things that people actually want at a price that people actually will pay then it's like an invisible hand will just smooth and move things where they need to go and the economy will take care of itself. That's, that's his idea. Um, is that correct? Uh, sort of, but sort of not. It just depends on the situation, but that's his approach. Okay, so in other words, what he's saying is that it shouldn't be like this. It shouldn't be that everything is run by, you know, some central power. It should just leave economies to be, uh, to run on the little guy at the bottom. Let them uh, run the economy, okay? And that's, that's similar to what we said before with capitalism, okay? The, the idea of capitalism is that not some government officials, but just guys on the ground, individual businessmen, they should be the ones um, controlling the economy, controlling the resources, setting the prices, determining how much to make of this and that and where to trade it. They're the ones that should be doing that, right? That's the idea of capitalism. It's that private individuals and groups in the bottom not government, should make the economic decisions, okay? Now, these are schools of, just to be clear, like it's not like either or, like you have to pick one. These are schools of thought. A lot of people get messed up today because they think that everything's either black or white. There's a whole lot of middle ground, right? Um, like even in the United States today, we have a capitalist country, um, but at the same time, our government does make some economic decisions, right? Governments do make economic decisions. We have central bank and all, all kinds of stuff that the government does. So there's no such thing as a purely capitalist or purely centralized economy, you know? Okay, so, um, but this general idea of having private individuals run the economy and do their own thing, like we saw last time with the charter companies, 
right? Like the British East India Company and the Dutch East India Company. Uh, that started to gradually replace this mercantilism back here. So it was more and more individuals running the economy than um, individual businesses and, and companies than a central government. Okay, so that's just a little bit of the theory behind all that. Um, and today, by the way, the word capital, what does it mean today? Well, now it just means anything you can use to make wealth. You know, it's, it's money. You can make more money out of money or it's, it's even your, your labor, your effort, your, your knowledge, your skills, your degrees, anything that can be used to make wealth, your the machines that you have in effect. All right, so that's a little theoretical background about what's happening in this time. Let's go into the real specifics, okay? First, let's look at the Spanish. Here's a map of the colonies in the new in the Americas in 1800. Okay, we're skipping ahead a little bit, but um, we can see that the Spanish is green and obviously they have a lot of territory, okay? This is Mexico up here. This is, it's now called Mexico, this whole area here. This is the United States up here. Uh, all these countries all the way down to the bottom of South America. And um, let's look at how they lived, okay? Um, they were trading just to be, this is, I find this fascinating myself. So here's Latin America. But remember, they had the Philippines too over here, okay? And this is, to me, amazing. They would basically have a, a, a trans-Pacific shipping to where um, you could send something from, in other words, the Philippines was connected to China. So here's China. And the Portuguese had Macau, right? So in other words, stuff from China could go through the Portuguese and come to Spanish Philippines. From there, they'd send it across the Pacific Ocean to Mexico to Panama, which is now the Panama Canal today, but there was a big road instead of a canal back then called the Camino Real, Royal Road. Cross over little skinny Panama at our side and then send it back to Spain like this. So in other words, there was trade across the Pacific and the Atlantic between Spain and China through the Philippines, Mexico, Panama, all the way across, right? So you're talking about global shipping routes. It's really amazing how far these guys went. Um, and I should say too, that over time, just uh, the lot of Chinese people moved to the Philippines as well. The Philippines is native Filipino Islanders, but they're also Spanish are mixed in there ethnically. And then a lot of Chinese people too. So if you go to the Philippines today, is sort of a, the three main ethnic groups, Filipino, Chinese, and Spanish, all blended together. All right, let's look at the Spanish uh, settlements. How did they actually live? Let's look at their um, missions and their cities and their uh, haciendas, three things. So these guys are missionaries. A missionary is like a, somebody sent to teach a new place about a religion or teach people in another place about a religion, missionaries. We still have missionaries today. And um, they established, in, in the New World, uh, Spanish missionaries established these things that they called missions, right? The actual buildings called a mission. So it's a church that's designed for that, kind of like a little headquarters. It could be in the jungle. It could be like in the middle of a tropical, you know, plains or something like that in Paraguay. There's a lot of these things actually down there. Um, but they kind of look like this. And then the priests would, would that'd be their headquarters. And then they try to like, convert indigenous people. Um, they often had like farms and factories and they made stuff in there and they invited indigenous people and brought them in to work and stuff. Um, this is more, much more friendly than the conquistadors, right? This, the conquistadors will tend to be brutal, but these guys, the priests tend to be nicer and more friendly towards the Native Americans. Okay, so these missions were religious centers and churches, but they were also kind of production centers for industries as well. Um, now, you guys are not too far from California, right? So this is in North America, a, little, a map of the missions. This is where we get a lot of the names of places in California, like San Francisco was a mission, okay? And Santa Barbara, like you, you see Santa Barbara, University of California, Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara's right there. These are San Juan Capistrano. These are actual places today, cities in California and towns named after these missions, okay? So you can see most of them are on the, the Pacific coast, um, and then also some of the interior in Texas and, and those areas as well. There's tons more if we keep going down. I don't have another map of Central America and South America. There's a lot down there too, just to let you know. Um, okay, so these missions, you can still see a lot of these today, like the leftover ruins of these, these uh, buildings. And some of them have been restored. 
And also the, the truth is that today people use that style to just build stuff. They build like a shopping mall or something in that style, mission style. So it's a, it's a big, you know, it's a big uh, general architectural style. Um, another style that's very popular actually today with houses and stuff is the Hacienda style. And an Hacienda is a big estate, big bunch of land that was given to you uh, as typically to a conquistador, you know. Um, farmland, it was used for sometimes for other things like factories and mines, but usually like a cattle ranch, lots of cows walking you know, around and, and plantations, etc. But these are not for priests as much. These are more for um, like just individual people, you know, individual conquistadors or, or leaders. And uh, you can see the Hacienda style had this kind of open air in the, in the middle like this a lot of times. And that created like an indoor outdoor space. In other words, like you could be outdoors even if you were inside the doors. You see what I'm saying? You can be, you can be open to the sky even if you were protected inside of the building. You know, and that allowed people to get the sun and everything that they wanted without having to worry about getting, you know, getting attacked or something outside or something bad happening or secure inside. Because this is still a very popular style today. There's a lot of hotels that look like this in Latin America, even in California, in the Hacienda style. Um, it's kind of an interesting little tidbit of history. So the Roman Empire ended a thousand years before this, over a thousand years before this. But during Roman times, there was a practice where people who were soldiers in the Roman Empire, um, as a reward for their service, they were given these huge farms, farm estates. If you saw the movie Gladiator, uh, you know, the main character, Russell Crowe, he's got this massive estate in uh, Hispania, in Roman Spain. And those estates were called latifund latifundia, latifundium, singular, or latifundia, plural. And so uh, basically giving a soldier uh, a big farm estate as a reward. And this is still a continuation of the same basic practice. In other words, these giving these haciendas to conquistadors in the new world was, was like the same uh, tradition, in the same tradition as the Roman uh, practice of giving soldiers these giant farms. Okay, so just interesting that, that tradition stuck around for like over a thousand years, um, the, the Roman traditions in Europe. Uh, what about the Spanish cities? Spanish towns and cities, colonial cities in the New World. Um, those, you may remember that uh, I told you about a priest named Bartolomé de las Casas who wrote letters to the King of Spain complaining about the way that Native Americans would be treated. And partly in response to that and other things, the King of Spain came up with a, like a rule book, you might say, a handbook on the left. You see right here? It says, Recopilación de las Leyes de los Reinos de las Indias. Right? It's the, the laws of the Indies. Okay, so it's the rule book for how Spanish people were supposed to colonize the New World. Like specifics, not like generality, like very specific things. Like how wide the streets should be and where to find new towns. Like one of, them, one of the rules is that when you're trying to figure out where to put a settlement, look at the native people and try to find a place where the native people look really healthy. Because if they look really healthy, there's probably like clean water and good good food and stuff around that area. So look for the healthy people and then build something there. You know? um, but this is a whole rule book. You can find it online. It's a long set of rules. And um, what I'm showing you in this picture is actually not even in Latin America. This is in the Philippines here. Even in the Philippines, they had the same rules Okay, in, in the downtown colonial Manila in the Philippines. Okay, So all over the Spanish-speaking world. Um, what were some of the rules for cities? Okay, so here's three three big ones. They're not the only ones, but three big ones. Here's a uh, a map of kind of the standard like blueprint for a Spanish colonial city. Okay, you had to have a plaza in the middle. Okay, plaza mayor, plaza central right here. It's a central square. Okay, plaza. There had to be at the bottom here. There had to be a church on one side, or a cathedral or whatever. It had to be uh, the government offices G on the other side. Okay, church on one side, government on the other. Check this out. So here's Panama City, Panama. Uh, here's a plaza. And here's a church on one side. <laughs> right? They got the church on the one side, old church, but church on one side. And the other, other side, they would have like, like this stuff, um, government buildings over there. Okay, so all the towns in Latin America were built like this. 
it's kind of remarkable because you can go from a long way from Argentina to Mexico, it's just thousands of miles, and the towns look the same in, in some way. Um, and then around that, you'd have like stores and other things, all these S's around there. Okay, so this common pattern. Another common pattern is that they would have these, see these archways? These also date back to Roman times. See the archways there? They're called portales in Spanish, okay? But like this pattern. And what that is, is a way of having people able to do business on the street without being under the hot sun. There's a lot of places are tropical, they're very, very hot. So you, you kind of like, again, indoor, outdoors, you're, you're doing business on the street, but you're in the shade at the same time. Okay, so they created a street life, an opportunity for street life, um, but shaded. Okay, so that's pretty cool thinking. Um, they, these laws, again, they're, they're, they're meant to be like the best practice, what we call today, like best practices, you know, like the best ideas, and then try to get everybody to do that. And then um, one other one that's important is uh, narrow streets. If, if they said if it's really hot and sunny, you should build narrow streets like this, see? again in Panama because see the shade the narrow streets will keep the sun off the street and they said if it's cold do the opposite make wide streets to allow the sun to come in and warm things up okay and you, you, again you see this all over Latin America these same styles okay so they all go back to this book this rule book sort of the laws of the Indies okay and many other things as well um it's also said in there that the Spanish were supposed to not force religion onto native people. They were supposed to kind of convince, be nice and friendly, and by their example and by kind of convincing them to convert to Christianity, they should do it that way. It didn't always work out like that. Uh, it often was very brutal. Um, but sometimes it was and sometimes it wasn't. Okay, so it was a mixed bag in the New World. But at the end of the day, the native people were treated not well. You know, they were used at the bottom of the hierarchy remember we saw the different high racial hierarchies and stuff and that's what this pink category is on the outside it says urban fringe isolated houses and quintas that's that's basically the quintas are are the native americans had to stay out there okay and this actually brings up a good point about history that the nature of cities has changed a lot over time in over thousands of years and sometimes in history like the middle ages and then right here like you know Renaissance, stuff like that. There's a lot of places that had walled cities, for example, but to be in a city, like today we say, oh, I'm gonna go to a city, I'm gonna go to New York. You just, what do you do? Well, you just walk into New York. No one's gonna stop you, right? But for a lot of times in history, you can just walk into a city. You had to have permission to be in the city. They had to have a reason to be there. Um, especially if it's a walled city, they'd have guards and you only certain people could go into that city. You have to have a license or be a member of the city. Okay, a medieval walled town. So you have to be a member of the town. So, um, or else have permission to go in that town. And this was like that. Native American people were sort of relegated to the outskirts of this and they protected the inside. All right. So, those are a couple aspects that, and you see these all over Latin America. Um, one last thing about the Spanish, there's lots more we could say, but one more thing is that besides these giant sugar plantations and you know, other things that we talk, cattle ranches and everything. They were sending pineapples back to Spain. A lot of things that they were sending back to Spain. Um, the big thing, too, was gold and silver. And they used Native Americans as labor, essentially slave labor, uh, often to mine these things. And this is an incredible thing. But in, in a country called Bolivia in South America today, which is then part of the larger state of Peru, or uh, vice royalty of Peru. Um, there's a single mountain you see on the left there. It's called Cerro de Potosí. It's very high, um, which 80% of the world's silver came from that mountain right there, that single mountain. 80% of the silver used around the world, including to trade with China, as we'll see later, uh, China would only accept silver, um, came from this single mountain right here. And it's still there. The mountain is still there. Okay, so... It's just kind of weird. That, that's one reason how the Spanish were able to get so wealthy is because they could literally just dig up silver. dig up, It's like digging up money, basically, and then just uh, use it to, to trade with the world. Okay? All right, so gold and silver mines. Um, what about the British? Let's shift to the British, okay? Um, there's a famous saying, the sun never set on the British Empire. 
And you can see these orange areas here are British colonies around the world. Okay, so like eventually later, this is in the 1800s, but Canada, um, little bits of Central and South America, like British Honduras, stuff like that, British Caribbean islands, um, South Africa, a bunch of colonies in the West Coast of Africa here, like Ghana, Australia, New Zealand, and India, okay, India too, um, which was massive. So originally, you know, it's like what's now the United States, America was what they call the jewel in the crown of the British Empire, like the most valuable colony. But they lost it, right? Because they had American Revolution, it became a country, the United States. So then India became the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. And that's a famous nickname for India, okay? the jewel in the crown. Um, so let's look a little bit about British India. This, um, you know, these British guys traveling by boat, just think about it, around Africa to the other side of the, you know, other side of Africa, the Indian Ocean, and then colonizing this territory. India's, uh, the British experience in India had two waves, okay? Well, actually three, but in terms of ruling India, like we said last time, there was the British East India Company, which actually ruled large parts of India for about 100 years. A company ruled India for about 100 years. But then that uh, basically had a meltdown, which I'll explain in a second, and they were tossed out. And then the British, the British government itself, like the Queen of England, took over Britain. Okay, uh, And that was uh, the rest of this time, from 1859 to the time the British left, 1947. That's called the British Raj. Okay, everybody in India knows that. It's the, the, the Raj is the era when the, it just, Raj just means rule. Okay, so the British rule, the British Raj is the period when the government of Britain, not the company, the East India Company, but the actual British crown ruled India. Okay, so those are two periods. Let's see how that happened. How did it get like that? Um, the British East India Company eventually ruled India, but they didn't just walk in and start taking over. It's actually the opposite of that. They remember they was that started in 1600, 1602. Okay, the British East India Company. So that's way before 1758, which is the time they started ruling. So it happened in those 150 years. Well, basically all they did at the beginning was start little trading colonies, trading trading posts along the edge along the coast of India, just trading stuff, making money, trading. And so did the Dutch, and so did the Portuguese and other, other groups too. At the beginning, the Europeans were all, a bunch of European colonies were there, little colonies. And they started to fight each other, especially the British and the Dutch. So the British East India Company and the Dutch East India Company also had like military aspects to them too. They were fighting each other over trade. Um, and then slowly but surely, they started to grow their colonies and they got in tight like you see in the picture here, they got in really well with the government of India. Now, at that time, in, India is a mostly Hindu country. Okay, you probably know that. It's a Hindu, it's like 80% Hindu, and it was back then too. But there's been these periods in history when India has been ruled by Muslims, a minority. In this case, it's called the Mughals. Okay, that's the guy in the picture there. And um, so you had a Muslim minority ruling, the Mughals ruling over. Hindu majority. And the British got in, you know, became friendly with the Mughals. And the Mughals basically allowed the British to do more and more active roles in administration, in like running the, running the trade and setting up the networks and the roads and stuff like that. To where eventually the Mughals just turned over large parts of India to the British, okay, and the British, the British East India Company. Okay, so it wasn't like the British just walked in there and started shooting people. It wasn't like that at all. It was a very slow process of forming political relationships with the government to the point where the government kind of turned over large sections of India to them. Okay, this is a British East India uh, Company ship on the left there. Okay, and remember, this is a charter company, charter company, which has a, like a license or a paper that says you can trade with India from the king or queen of England. As the British gained control of India, British East India Company, they they weren't like exclusive. They allowed Indian got people to become part of the ranks of the company, of the British East India Company, with uniforms and guns and swords and knives and all this stuff. And the name for those guys was sepoys, sepoys. Now, the, the sepoys could never rise to the top ranks, okay? But 
they were they could be important though. Okay, so these are all Indian guys who were members of the British East India. They were working in the British East India Company in all different aspects, all different like the military, like in like police, like in intelligence and trade, all kinds of stuff. It's a very odd thing, right? <laughs> very odd thing. Um, and so uh, this went on for, like we said, 1758 to 1857, almost 100 years. Okay, What happened? Well, there came a point where the British started to become insensitive and developed a lot of tension with the sepoys. Let me explain how that happened. So at the beginning um, of the 1700s and early 1800s, during this period of the British East India Company, a lot of people came over from Britain were fascinated with Indian stuff, right? Their language, their culture, their dance, all these different things, Hinduism. Um, this guy on the left here, Sir William Jones, is very famous for like writing down a lot of languages which had not been written before, like a lot of spoken languages in India which had not been written. He knew like lots of different languages and was a real ling language scholar. They set up whole universities over there for languages and stuff to, to, to study Indian culture. It was good. Okay. And that whole kind of idea is called Orientalism. Orientalism. It's the, this fascination with studying Indian uh, customs and culture and language that British and other scholars had at that time, living over there in India. Okay. So that's all like, seems like everything is going good, right? You see on the right there, this guy is learning from this Indian scholar is explaining how to write, you know, uh, in another language to this British guy over here. So they're like learning from each other. Things are going well, it seems like. What happened? Well, over time, um, this is, and this is a very interesting point to think about, especially right now in history today. It's been pointed out in different times and different cultures over many, many centuries. Let me tell you what it is. You'd think that the more people get, the more like, you know, group A and group B, Indians and British or, black and white, or whatever, whatever groups you have, diff different groups who are unequal, and they start to get more and more equal, right? And you think, oh, well, as groups get more and more equal to each other, like on the ground, like the actual conditions get equal, you think like after a while, they just kind of go, I guess we're equal, everybody's happy, we all hold hands and become friends, right? And in other words, that you think like, man, maybe the, all those negative tensions go away. But actually, what really happens, and um, this has been pointed out, especially by Alexis de Tocqueville, um, a French guy who visited the United States, when people get more and more equal, who were unequal before, they actually start paying more attention to all the little ways that they're not equal, right? All the little things, they start to get bothered by all the little ways that they're unequal. And especially people who used to be, you know, sort of a class above another class, they start to get a little bit angry when these when these guys become equal over here. They get resentful and they're like, "No, you're taking my you're taking my job, you're taking my status," and that's what happened. Okay, so the more equal the Indians became to the British colonists, especially as the British started sending over more soldiers to kind of reinforce and hold, you know, secure India who are not really Orientalists. These guys are not scholars; they didn't care about Indian culture. There's some British guys. They became more and more racism, right? The more equal they became, the more racist they became. Isn't that strange? So instead of just saying everyone's brother is on the same level, they said, no, 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 we're here, you're here, dude. <laughs> they tried to keep that difference. And racism and racial uh, divides, okay, became more and more increased the more equal people got. Isn't that strange? Okay, so India started to turn into a harsher place. In terms of those distinctions, it was no longer just, you know, the East India Company in a friendly way working with the Mughals. Now, now it was more divided. And Indian people were basically put to work processing opium, which is a drug. We're going to see that was sent to China. They, they basically became a British became drug dealers and sent drugs to China and basically got people hooked on opium in China, opium wars. And you can see this massive opium factory over here. Okay. Um, look at all this. This is a, a drug uh, similar to uh, the same plant as, as heroin, which is very addictive drugs. Okay, so these, all of a sudden things start to go south, start to go bad in terms of the relations between British and Indians to the point where 
there's a famous episode and the story goes like this, that basically the, the, the sepoys, remember these guys, they organized a rebellion all across India in secret. And the British had absolutely no idea it was coming. This is one of like the biggest surprises in history where these sepoys, not in one, two, three cities, but all across India, which is a huge place, somehow managed to organize a mass mutiny or rebellion against the British without the British having any idea it was coming. And they say it was, uh, it was part, part of it was that these guys were Muslims and Hindus and the British were telling them they had to bite off the, the cartridges for their rifles and you stuff the thing, the, the, the ammunition down in the rifle and you gotta, you gotta bite off the top. And it was greased in pork fat, right? It was greased in pork fat. And pork fat, if you're Muslim, you're not allowed to eat pork, right? Not to eat pigs. And they're like, now you got to do it. And so they were like, they felt like it was culturally insensitive, basically. And that was one little last straw that lit the dynamite, you know, this rebellion. But to make a long story short, it ended up in what's called the Sepoy Mutiny of 1857. It's one of the biggest rebellions in human history. Okay. All across India, all these Indian guys that were inside the British East India Company led this massive rebellion against the British East India Company. They were mass massacres people died you know their battles were like thousands of people died all at the same time they buried them in these giant holes awful stuff okay so after this mutiny the sepoy mutiny the british east india company was done was done stick of work in it done okay so what happened next uh what happened next is that the british crown the british government rather than just giving up and leaving india and say okay we're out of here the British government moved in and said, this is now a, a crown colony, meaning it's not going to be run by a company. It's going to be run by the king and queen of England. Okay? And that's like we said, called that, that new period is called the British Raj, the British rule, straight rule of India. And then that would end in 1947, which we'll talk about later in the last class. Okay, so Brit Britain, uh, the company ruled it for 100 years and then the Raj, uh, another 90 or so. All right, and uh, just to be clear, the British India, East India Company was was over; it no longer existed after that. All right. Um, before we leave, the, I'm going to leave it there, and then we'll, we'll pick it up in the next class and what happens next. But um, just to give you a, an idea, during that British Raj era that came later, the there were still Indians fighting in the British ranks, even in World War II and in World War One. Not just Indians, but all different British colonies. British colonies in Africa, British colonies in India uh, were fighting with the British Empire, you know, against the Nazis and all that in World War II, you know, in North Africa and other places too. So it was really a world war. So it just shows you how big these empires were, how like you know, diverse people in there. All right. What about North America, which would become the United States? Uh, North America... As we, uh, as we know, it was also British colonies. And we said to be last time, the first two were Massachusetts and Virginia. Those are the first two colonies. First, Virginia and Jamestown and then Virginia and then Plymouth and Boston and Massachusetts. And those are very important colonies. I should just say a side note that the first five presidents of the United States, like George Washington, Adams, Jefferson, John Quincy Adams, et cetera, um, were all from those same two states, okay, when, when those colonies became states, the first five presidents of the United States were from Virginia and Massachusetts, just those two states, all for all five. Uh, just for the big picture, these 13 colonies would rebel against Britain, right? Starting on July 4th, this is the 4th of July, 1776. And that's when the Declaration of Independence was signed. And that's when they broke away from Britain and said, we are no longer colonies, we are a country. Okay, it became a country. It was the first time any, any of these colonies had ever done that. Okay, first, all these colonies we're talking about, first ones to say, nope, we're now a country, to break away. And um, we'll talk more about that in the next class. But that's, that's what happens. But let's look at the life in those colonies. Um, we divide the colonies up into three, okay? So we have New England, the, the Northern colony, even today we call this region New England up here, okay, the New England colonies. The middle colonies, 
okay, which is like New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware. And then the Southern calendar, which is Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Did, later on, they added all this other stuff over here, like Florida and Alabama. That's That comes later. That was not part of the original colonies. Um, and just to be clear, what's up here, the New England colonies were Massachusetts, okay, New Hampshire, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Vermont was like, wasn't wasn't officially a colony. And this, see this part up here? Today, this is the state of Maine. But actually, Maine was just part of Massachusetts. Massachusetts was bigger back then. Okay, and Rhode Island is really, really small. It's still small, smallest state in the United States. So let's look at some of the differences between these colonies. It's kind of very interesting. Um, we'll look at their economy and their religion, but just first, uh, as far as slavery goes, we know that the South had much more, had, was like the center of slavery because of the nature of their plantations were extremely big. And there's probably a geographic reason for that. Let me explain. So there's a set, of, I don't even can see it very well. There's a set of mountains called the Appalachian Mountains, okay? It goes straight down where my pointer is like this. See these kind of ridgy looking things out like this. You see that Appalachian Mountains it says right there? Those mountains, now notice the, the coast is flat. It's like China, actually. The, the coast, coastal plain is flat. And then as you go in inside, you get the mountains. But look, the space that you have up here between here and the mountains is like not that much compared to the space that you have down here. Okay, the mountains get further and further inland. That means that you have bigger, flatter areas that have bigger, massive farms. See what I mean? You have a wider coastal plain. And it's, it's very wet and rainy because you're on the coast. There's plenty of ocean water coming on shore. Okay, so the further you go down, the mountains get further inland like this, which opens up more space for farms. That's one of the reasons why southern farms are huge. And the northern farms tended to be not as big. They didn't need as much slave labor or stuff like that for that. Um, so just in terms of the slavery part, you may be wondering like, well, how much slavery was there exactly between the North and the South? What was the difference? Well, let me just give you some numbers from 1790. This is just like 14 years after the beginning of the United States because it was technically not colonial, but it's the only stats I could find. Probably wasn't that different 20 years before when they were colonies. So if you look at this, basically it's listing the colony, the, the U.S. states at the very, very beginning of the United States from the least amount of slavery towards the top to the ones that had the most slavery at the bottom, right? Like uh, they're kind of going like physically, what they're doing on the list is going from north to south physically, okay? And look, there were some states which had no slavery at all, like Maine and Massachusetts, uh, these northern states, right? 16 slaves, a very small amount. Um, and then you get down to the southern colonies, and all of a sudden you're talking like 300,000, three quarters of a million, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, or Virginia. These are massive slave states, okay? So these are where the plantations were in the south. So we have basically the percentage of population that's slaves for all of these first one, two, three, four, five, six is either zero to one, right? Zero, one, point one, something like that. It's still a problem, obviously, but you can just see it's not that much of a part of the economy uh, compared to the cell. Okay, the, the whole set of industries that they did was different. So let's take a look at what those industries were. Um, up in the New England colonies, these are colder areas. You know, it's like uh, as far up in the north, the soil is rockier, you know, uh, and remember the mountains come in closer, it's a little hillier. Um, and so it's not as easy to farm up there. Soil is not as good for farming. When they had farms, a lot of dairy farms, because you can let cows walk around on the mountain, the slopes and stuff, but um, their economy was based on largely natural resources like forests and oceans. So, and often combining those. So like they would take the wood from the forests, that's logging, right, timber, and they would make ships out of it for the British Empire. Uh, I read somewhere, if I got this correct, that half of the tra half of the cargo in the British Empire at one point was traveling on ships built in New England, right? So New England built ships, not just for New England, but for the British Empire in general. At that certain point was half of the cargo was transported on those ships. Um, and then fishing and whaling and all these guys are drying and salting fish in this picture on the right, right? salting up there. 
There's even a place in Massachusetts called, famous place called Cape Cod, you know, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, because these are, these are cod fish. Um, I, say, I think cod in Chinese, I think it's daimu. I forget, I said daimu, something like that. I don't know. Anyway, but you can see shipbuilding and cod and fishing and all these things. This is what they did. Okay, so they're living close to the close to nature. Even now, there's a big fishing industries and there's big uh, logging industries again, like in Maine and places like that. But you notice it also says whaling. You might think, why whaling? Were people eating whales? No, it wasn't so much for eating. Um, they might have eaten whales, but they the big thing for whales, whales were like, you know, so many things today we use plastic and oil, you know, for fuels in the ground and we use natural gas. But we use these natural resources. Plastic comes from petroleum oil, but they didn't have that stuff then. They needed other basic natural resources to make fuel out of. And whale oil was a fuel. So you had, see their lamp on the right? The typical lamp had it was a whale oil lamp, okay? Whale oil lamp and lanterns and um, to keep the lights on, you know? Uh, this is before electricity. And you use whale oil to make candles and, and lamps and to put in your hair. You know, men slick their hair back with, with late, later on, especially in the 1800s when style has changed. Um, for soap, for if you had like a wood cabinet, you would rub whale oil to make it smooth. You know, they used it for all kinds of stuff, the grease, grease machines, you know, like little watches later on. So this is how it worked. This is off the coast of uh, New England here, painting famous painting and you take this big spear thing this harpoon and you got to kill the whale with that right they take this other big thing i don't think it's in the picture a hook you drive this hook in there and you got to hook it and you got to drag this thing uh and if you notice in the in the back is a big steamship i mean a big uh, a big sailing ship right but there's these fires on it, okay and the, what they would do is they would um, actually take the whale fat, okay? Because the, what they were looking for for the whale was the whale fat it's called blubber, like these giant chunks of fat, okay? And then they would put that fat onto the ship in a big bonfire, big fires, okay? And so the ship was like a, like a processing plant, a factory or something for whale oil. And what you do is you put these giant chunks of fat into the oil, into the, into the fire, and it melts. It's called rendering, rendering oil, rendering fat. You can do this on your stove too, but you just let it let it cook like that for a while, and it gradually turns into liquid. The hard fat turns into liquid, but it takes time. They would do that right on the ocean, and then they would come back to the shore and then sell that oil right there, like in big vats and barrels and stuff like that. In other words. Um, they would use the, the ship itself would be like a little factory to render a little plant to render whale oil. Okay, so, and you'd have these giant fires out on the ocean that were rendering whale fat, basically. Okay, this is a major, major thing that they did. All right. Um, has anybody ever eaten, any of you guys ever eaten whale meat before? No? Have you ever gone on a whale watching tour? If you live in Seattle, they probably have stuff like that up there, right? In Washington State, they got those whale watching tours. Have you guys done that before? Are you going to ship and you watch the whales jump out of the water and stuff like that? Nobody? Okay. I, I had whale meat one time in uh, Japan. I was walking down the streets in Tokyo and somebody randomly was doing like a tasting, you know, in the, for whale meat. And they say, hey, you want to try this? I said, okay. It didn't taste very good. Um, they were making a commercial, you know, I went like this and they, they got what they wanted, I guess. <laughs> um, Okay, what about these New England, besides whales and fishing and logging, what else was going on in the New England colonies? They were very, remember, they were founded by those really religious people, the Puritans, remember? They were very religious. And they're famous for holding small town meetings. Even today, they still do it. It's an American tradition. This is like a part of America. Even on CNN, the, the news they, have, they call CNN Town Hall on the cable news. Um, it's an American thing, the town hall meeting. And the idea is that anybody in the town can show up and speak, that you have the right to say what you want to say. And you, have, you, can, it's a, uh, you, know, you can contribute to the, the decision-making of the town. Okay? And that goes back to the New England colonies, okay? this American tradition of town hall meetings. Um, they also, it was in New England that we got Thanksgiving, you know, the, the holiday called Thanksgiving. The, the Native Americans taught many things to the 
British settlers, the pilgrim, the original one called the pilgrims, the Puritans. Um, one of the things that they taught on the right was how to grow these three crops that the Indians grew together. Uh, corn, which comes from Americas. Uh, squash, which is like, you know, orange and yellow, like pumpkins and stuff like that type of stuff. Um, I don't know how to say squash Chinese, but it's squash and then beans. They would let the beans grow, uh, like wrap around the corn, like a beanstalk, they let the corn be the pole. Greens, and so they called those the three sisters. The Indians called those the three sisters, the Native Americans. Okay, so squash at the bottom, corn and beans around the outside. And so they also showed the uh, British how to hunt turkeys, you know, like, and that's why we eat turkey on Thanksgiving. Because remember the first colony in Massachusetts, 1620, uh, which is the second colony in the Americas. So the first one was in Virginia, Jamestown, 1607. Okay, but the Plymouth colony in 1620 was when they landed. And one year later, they were like, thank you. Like, thank you that I'm alive, right? Like, we're, we're still alive. I've still the pulse, right? That's what Thanksgiving is. It's basically saying, hey, we survived one year. Like, yes, great, fantastic, right? Let's have like a meal here. Let's do something. And so that's what Thanksgiving is. It, it was uh, Native Americans and the Puritans eating together, just celebrating, giving thanks to God, basically for for just being being there and being alive and having a successful colony for one year. Because okay? people died, you know, on on the way. People died when they were there and when they were colonizing the New World. So just to be alive was like a blessing, you know. So that's what Thanksgiving is. It's just kind of saying thanks for all the good things to God that that were given. Sometimes we forget all the good stuff one year after the first landing. Um, as you know, the New England, New England colonies are very strict and very, very intolerant. They were not tolerant about religions. If you didn't, if you did something against their religion, they'd throw you out of the colony, right? And this happened all the time. In fact, that's actually one of the reasons why a lot of the other colonies started, like Rhode Island and some of the other colonies, people that got thrown out of Massachusetts, <laughs> um, you know? And what we're gonna see is the middle colonies were a little more tolerant. And so people were just, people who didn't fit in with the hardcore religion of, the, of Massachusetts, they went down there. Um, you may have heard about the witch trials, like in Salem witch trials in Massachusetts, where they, the Puritans sometimes had these trials, they'd accuse somebody, some woman of being a witch. And then people got killed that, people got executed that way, you know, condemned to death for being a witch, you know? So some, some really strange stuff. This is very early on in the 1600s, 1700s. Okay, um, Salem, Massachusetts, the, the witch city. <laughs> um, so that just shows you how serious they were about this religion. Let's get down to the middle colonies. This would be like New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware, a little Delaware over here, okay? These colonies were in a good spot, good spot geographically. Why were they in a good spot? A couple things. A, like you said, the mountains get wider, get, get further out there. So you got all this bigger space. B, look how wavy their coastlines are. They go in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. They got all these good harbors there, good harbors, okay? Like Philadelphia and New York City. They don't show on the map, but here's Philadelphia down here and New York City. Really good harbors, okay? Meaning boats can come in and out easily. Um, we'll talk more about that in a second. So you have good farming areas, good harbors. Um, it was nicknamed the breadbasket colonies because they grew lots of oats and wheat. It was good for growing oats and wheat. Have you ever seen this before, this brand, Quaker Oats? Okay, so that's like a, the main brand of oats in the United States, probably the world, I guess. But why Quaker Oats? Because Pennsylvania is the Quaker state. Quakers are another type of Christians, another like little group from England that came over, another serious religious group. So let's take a look at that for a second. So the Quakers were one of many like other religions that went to the middle colonies, which was more diverse. And they're especially known for being in Pennsylvania. Okay, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is named after a Quaker guy named William Penn. Penn, Pennsylvania. It's also an Ivy League school. Maybe you heard of Penn. Penn uh, University of Pennsylvania is an Ivy League school. Um, the Quakers were religious people who believed really strongly in equality, that everybody was equal. And they didn't like having anybody, any classes and ranks and stuff like that. And that's one of the reasons why they were among the most important leaders of the abolition movement in the, United, in, in the United States and even in the colonies before, meaning they were very much against um, slavery. 
right? They didn't like slavery at all. Um, okay, so they helped to lead. Quakers were instrumental, really important in ending slavery in America. They fought to end slavery. They also, William Penn himself, this guy in the middle, made a treaty with Native Americans. They tended to treat Native Americans as equal. Not necessarily, they didn't, they didn't think they were equal culturally because um, they thought that, that they were a little bit kind of like wild men and the British had a more civilized culture, to be honest. But they, they thought of them as equal as human beings, you know? And that treaty um, lasted for over 70 years. They made a peace treaty with Native Americans. Okay, so that's that shows kind of their spirit of equality, that they were willing to bargain and make a treaty with another group it was totally different from them. Okay, so Pennsylvania is known as the Quaker State. Quaker State, and we get Quaker oats in the bread basket there. Um, the I'll come back to that in a second, but the middle colony is, like we said, had diverse groups of people, Catholics, Jews, Lutherans, uh, like from the middle of uh, Europe, like, you know, German, German type people, Presbyterians from Scotland. Um, different towns had different rules. So if there's a lot of Presbyterian people, they had like Presbyterian rules. If another town had a lot of uh, Quakers, they had Quaker rules, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, but you can see they were trading and trading and trading, but they were uh, more tolerant of different religions. Now, um, oops. Let me explain something that's very important geographically. You might say, why were they trading? What were they trading for and how? Like just with England or what? Well, what they were trading was with their own other colonies. Because if you look at the map here, this is the thing that, that I realized much later. I read this great essay by a guy named Alan Guelzo. He explained this really well. These colonies that you see in this picture, okay? Today, if I want to go from D.C. to New York to Boston, I don't get in a boat, right? I just get in the car. I drive up Interstate 95 and pay the tolls and pretty soon eight hours later, I'm in Boston, right? Or take a train or a flight, whatever. It wasn't like that back then. Nobody was taking roads, right? With a horse. Nobody was taking roads from Virginia to Boston. Nobody was doing that. What were they doing? They were taking ships, okay? So it was almost like these colonies were almost like different countries or something. They were just, people would have to go from one to the other on a ship. They'd go from here to Boeing, you know, to, to, to Philadelphia, Boeing, to New York, Boeing, to Boston. You'd sail from colony to colony. You would trade stuff on a ship from colony to colony. Not, you know, there was no big trucks with huge wheels and everything like that. Nothing like that. So you would sail up and down the coastline to trade with all these colonies. That's why the ports were so important. Okay. Now, like Boston, like Philadelphia, like New York City, like Baltimore, et cetera, et cetera. But now look, where are the middle colonies? Oh, they're right in the middle of all of that sailing, right? So in other words, if you want to trade stuff from the New England colonies, like ships and lumber and whale oil and all that, and you want to send that down to Virginia, you're going to probably bounce through the middle colonies on your way into Philadelphia, into New York. So in other words, they're in the center and people are trading up and down the coast in ships and they always stopping there in the middle. So they made money on buying and selling, import, export like that. Not even just with England, but just with, the, with their own colonies that were above them and below them, right, on the way. Okay, plus they made their own stuff too. So it was a very, very uh, good place to be, okay, the middle colonies. And that's one of the reasons why New York City is such a big, such a business center, right? That's, that's one reason. Okay, so this is just showing you the kind of business people would do. This is, these are both pictures of New York City right here. Okay, where people, boats would come in all the time from above, from below, and also from Europe. Um, all right. Little side note. Uh, while all this was happening, we mentioned a peace treaty with Native Americans. Why do you need a peace treaty? Because there was a lot of wars and battles and uh, attacks between both, especially Native Americans raiding colonists and then vice versa. Sometimes the colonists would push out and try to eliminate Native Americans. There was very complex relationships between the British colonists and Native Americans, uh, friendly, not friendly, killing each other, back and forth. A lot of, a lot of what they just the generally they call it the American versus Indian Wars, the North American, okay? And just to pick one that's important of many, there's a, there's a huge episode called the Beaver Wars, like up in Canada and uh, New England and stuff, these massive wars between Indian tribes. 
um, and the British colonists and the French. But this is a big one. And this, this is called the French and Indian War. And it's is right before the American Revolution. It's important to understand. Because the American Revolution took place in 1776. This is right before that, a decade before that. And it's from the British perspective, it's the French and Indian War, because they were fighting against French and Indians. But French might call it something else. Okay. So it's really the British colonies versus the French in Canada and Louisiana. Okay. So the British versus the French. Remember, the French are like right behind those mountains. Along with all of these Native American tribes, which align themselves with either one, like all these one group of Amer Native American tribes aligned themselves with the British, fought with the British. Other Native American tribes fought with the French. Just a whole like street fight mess. Okay. This went on for a decade, 1754 to 63. Why is this so important? Important because, first of all, the British won. The British won. Okay? They defeated the French um, and they took Canada. This is what British government said before they got Canada. Maybe they bought Louisiana, but they took Canada. They took Canada right here. And secondly, the fact that they won gave the British confidence, okay? The British colonists, all well, those 13 colonies. Because what happened was, like, in this war, the British would send their own soldiers over, right, from England. They'd send their guys and Irish people and Scottish people, part of the British Isles. But... At the same time, some of the a lot of the colonists fought too. The guys who were living in the 13 colonies, they also fought in this too. People like George Washington. And he actually was bad. He was a bad, he didn't do very well. He lost several times in this as a leader in this war. But they got experience, the colonists who fought, and they they got experience and a little bit of confidence from, from winning. And that allowed them kind of momentum where they said, just 10 years after this, or 13 years after this, they said, you know what? If we decided to break away, we might be able to pull this off. We might be able to fight Britain and win, you know? And so this French and Indian War gave, gave a victory to the British in general, but including a lot of the colonists to gain experience and confidence they could, that they could fight, okay? And it helped to give them confidence to break away from England later. All right. What about the South? Um, let me just see. Hold on a second. Um, did we go over time? Oh gosh. Are we over time? Yeah, I think we are. Um, can you guys stay a couple more minutes? This, this is a big section. Do you guys have time to stay a couple more minutes? Or yeah? Okay. If you have to go, it's okay, but uh, I'll just finish this last bit here. There's a bit on China coming up at the end. So. Um, this is a huge section because there's so many colonies, you know. Uh, the southern colonies had Though obviously it's in the south, it's warmer, it's hot. It's very, in fact, it's not just warm, but hot when you go in the deep south, very hot. And this is where you had your big farms, your, your large scale. The, the, the whole economy was dominated by large scale plantation farming. Okay, because it was just a better uh, climate for farming. You, you, you know, you didn't have to do much work um, to, um, you know, to expand your farm because there was plenty of space already there for you. And uh, didn't have to cut through forests to get it. You know, there's the land right there. And obviously also it's where they use slavery the most, okay? Not only slaves uh, uh, from Africa, but also what they call indentured servants. Indentured servants were, were people from Britain, white people, who were basically had gotten into debt or done something wrong in, in England or something. And they were sent over as a punishment. They would have to be basically similar to slaves for like five years or 10 years or two years called indentured servitude, like you're paying off some debt or some crime or something like that. So that was, they were like working side by side with, with slaves. Um, the biggest, uh, at the beginning, the biggest crop for sale was tobacco, tobacco, right, for smoking. And by the way, back then, there were people who actually thought tobacco was good for you back then. They thought like, you know, if you're on the ocean, tobacco, if you have like a lot of sea air, like salt in your lungs and stuff, this tobacco will clear it right up. You know? <laughs> People thought smoking was healthy. Uh, of course it's not, but um, tobacco and then cotton and rice, things like that. Uh, rice was mostly just in the South Carolina coastline here, um, limited, but, uh, and I will say too, Maryland, see Maryland's up here, Maryland's kind of on the border between North and South. Like if you said today, Maryland's a Southern colony, people would be like, ah, really? Oh, it doesn't feel like a Southern colony. Because later in the Civil War, uh, Maryland 
uh, fought with the North. Okay, so culturally, I don't know how much South it is, but they lump it in with the Southern colonies sometimes. Um, and that was an unusual colony because Catholics were not really accepted in England and, uh, you know, in, in these, in America at this time, in these British colonies, but um, some people in Britain were Catholic and they said, let's make a Catholic colony for people who are Catholic. And they made Maryland a Catholic colony. Okay, so it's like a, a different from the other ones. So people who are Catholic, they would just go there and be, no, no one would bother them. Okay, but you can see how big this farm is at the bottom and all this cotton that's it's on it, this plantation. So the, a lot of the founding fathers of the United States, the people who, like Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration of Independence, he had a tobacco farm. It was massive. He had a plantation. He had slaves. Um, George Washington, the first president, he had a massive tobacco plantation. He had a lot of slaves. He had one of the highest numbers of slaves in the United States. Um, okay, so that's just how it was. But at the same time, it's very complex. It's hard to judge history because we're not in that time. You know, um, We have to think, okay, these guys also hated slavery. If you look at their writings, they, they both wrote, uh, a lot of people, including them, wrote many times that they did, detested slavery, they hated slavery. And they, Thomas Jefferson had a plan to get rid of slavery that he pushed for like 40 years, his entire adult life. He tried to put in a plan to phase out slavery over time. You might say, well, why didn't they just stop slavery when they started the United States? Uh, it's a complicated question, but basically, they were basically breaking away from the British Empire, the biggest, most powerful empire in history. And some of them did want to end slavery when they started. Like Thomas Jefferson wanted, he, wrote, he wrote, tried to write in the Constitution, no more slavery. Um, but other representatives at the Constitutional Convention wouldn't sign that. And they just figured, look, if we're going to make this country, we got to make it now. And we got to get this thing signed, you know, and maybe we can work on the slavery problem later, you know. Um, also, it would have completely transformed the United States economy to abolish slavery. And it's obviously very difficult to fight the British biggest empire in history while you're completely transforming your economy at the same time. You know, so there's a lot of just messiness to it, which which uh, prevented them from um, eliminating slavery. But as we said before, slavery was common in the French, the Spanish, uh, all other uh, Dutch, Portuguese, all other colonies as well. So it's complex. Um, on the right, you see a tobacco company advertisement. And the reason they have Native Americans smoking the tobacco is because that's 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 where the British, that's where the uh, the Europeans learned to smoke tobacco from. Uh, Native Americans taught at first the Spanish, actually, um, and then later the Portuguese, et cetera, and then the British to smoke tobacco. It's a Native American crop, tobacco. Okay, so they kind of associated with uh, even even in the state that I'm from. It's funny. Uh, in downtown Alexandria, Virginia, there was a tobacco shop on the old Colonial Street there, and the, the symbol for it, they have this giant, like life-size Indian Native American person because Native Americans kind of associated with tobacco. In the, in the, advertisements. Um, okay, so that's a little bit about the Southern colonies. Southern colonies. Um, one last little funny thing about that is that the, the Southern colonies were filled up with all different types of people, but they were always about making money in these big plantations, tobacco. But especially down here at the bottom, South Carolina and Georgia, there was a time when England had too many people in jail, in prisons, and to get rid of them, they just opened up the jails and they put them on ships and they sent them to the new world. They started with South Carolina and Georgia. So there's a, there's a chunk of people down there who are descended from basically people who are prisoners that would just like get out of here, go over to these colonies. So it's an interesting background to some of these people. All right. Last but not least, what about the Chinese world? What was happening at this time? First, let's talk about Taiwan. Then we'll talk about the rest of China itself. So if you go back to the year 1600, 15, whatever, there's not that many people in Taiwan at this time. Right? It was like 20,000 people on the island of Taiwan. Okay? So Taiwan is not a very heavily populated place. Even now, there's these tribes in Taiwan right, who live up in the mountains. So it's just a, like, aboriginal native people of Taiwan. Okay, So not that many people in Taiwan at the beginning. And the uh, Dutch, Portuguese, and Spanish all would establish these colonies on Taiwan. The Port Portuguese called it Formosa, which means a place that smells good, basically. 
most of them. Okay, and the longest lasting one of those um, in the middle was the Dutch one, okay, the Dutch colonies. I mean, excuse me, the, the Portuguese right here, 1732. All right, the Dutch only lasted uh, almost 40 years, the Spanish not that long, and then Portuguese for a couple hundred years. And this was like a trading post, you know, a tra to trade with China and to trade with other parts of the world in the East, maybe the Philippines, et cetera. When the Portuguese were colonizing this, like right here, and the Dutch and the Spanish, et cetera, uh, they actually, the, the Europeans encouraged, they went to China and they encouraged people from Fujian province in China to come over there. So like hundreds of thousands of people from Fujian moved across the Straits of Taiwan here to Taiwan during this time to work on colonial factories and stuff like that over there, called colonial uh, uh, industries. Okay, so a lot of people moved to take advantage from China, actually from mainland China to move to work on these for that purpose. Um, right across the way here, which would be like over here, I think on this map behind this arrow would be Macau. See the little Macau down here? The Portuguese also established that even earlier in 1535, like really a long time. Okay, so Macau is like super old. It's way older than Hong Kong. Um, again, there wasn't much going on there. It's true. Even later when the British took Hong Kong, there wasn't much going on there either. There wasn't a lot of people established there or anything like that. So it wasn't like they came in and battled and took it over. There was just like rocks and grass and you know stuff like that. Um, okay, so those are two little colonies, the, the Taiwan and then the little colony of Macau, which was set up as trading, trading areas to do business with the rest of China. But as we saw a little bit last time, uh, in mainland China, the emperor of China was up there in Beijing. They said, no one's going to trade with, no one's going to be just popping around China trade, right? We're going to limit it to one place. And that place is going to be the city that's now called Guangzhou. You guys know where Guangzhou is, right? It's one of the biggest cities in China. Okay, so here's Guangzhou right here. But back then, at least in English, the word for Guangzhou was Canton. Okay, so we say Cantonese is the language, like you yeah, yeah, language is Cantonese. So Guang, we can call it Guangzhou, we can call it Canton, whatever you want to call it. Well, let's call it Canton because that's what they called it back then. So that system, which lasted for 90 some years, was called the Canton system, where according to the rules of China, Chinese government, all foreigners could only trade in that one spot, okay? Which means they had to come up from around the world and somehow go up into this, uh, uh, what do you call it? The Pearl River Delta right here. I don't know why it says my, my PowerPoint label got messed up. I moved it around. So somehow it's, this is not Hong Kong. Hong Kong is over here. All right. Um, how did that work, the Canton system? Well, basically... Europeans had to pay high prices for pretty much everything because the government of China set the price, right? And so the, it's the Qing dynasty, the last dynasty of China. This is the guy with the hair, you know, the pulled back and the shaved head in the front, that thing. And so this is Canton at that time. The Europeans are doing deals. Uh, at one point, there was, you know, French and English, different, different uh, trading houses, which we'll see in a second. Okay, so China was in control. They were setting all the prices and all the rules, making money left and right. Um, the Chinese were not even interested in trading, really, in terms of like stuff. They didn't want the European stuff. They're like, they thought that they had better stuff than the Europeans. Yeah, we got silk. We don't need cotton. We have silk. Um, we, they thought they had better food, better, everything was better. So all they wanted was silver, like money, basically. They wanted silver, something to pay people with. That's what he's holding in his hand. Okay. They only was for, for a long time during this Canton system, Chinese merchants would only accept silver they wouldn't trade things for things um and also just from a geographic standpoint if you look at this map right here if you were coming in and we said portuguese macau to get to canton up here you have to go up along pro river delta here you weren't allowed to steer your own ship so if you're a european if you're spanish or french or dutch or whatever you have to stop here and you would in macau and you'd have to get a chinese pilot chinese driver to, to take your ship for you up into uh, the port of Canton, okay? So they had like total control of the prices, of the way you get in, right? Of the things that you pay with, everything was controlled by China. Um, and they had 
when, once you got to Canton, you weren't even allowed to get off the ship and just run around the city or anything like that. Canton was a walled city. You couldn't go in. If you're from there. All you could do was show up at these trading houses. There were 13 of them. And they're called the Hongs factories. And they're basically like a warehouse and a store. Like they have all the stuff inside that they're, that they're selling and then all the financial aspects to sell it. And you can see, look, there's a U.S. flag, right? British flag, Dutch flag, uh, Danish, Denmark, Sweden. There are all these different European countries, Spain, France, Portugal, all had a hong, all had a house, a trading house. But that house really belonged to Chinese merchants, okay, who were called kohongs. So hongs and kohongs. Kohongs were the guys who were the leaders of those houses, the Chinese basically representatives who paid money to the emperor in Beijing to be able to be the official guy who was going to run the show and make the money off the trade. They had a monopoly okay, on the trade with a certain country. In other words, they had one, one of these guys would be for trading with the British. One guy would be for trading with the Dutch. He would run this home. He, one guy for the US, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, these individual merchants. To the point where this guy on the right, who I don't know how to pronounce this, but Ho Kwa, something like that, became the wealthiest man in the world because basically he's just piling up silver from trading Chinese stuff um, to foreigners. Okay, so China was becoming very wealthy this way. We're going to see all this is going to become, this whole system is going to become messed up uh, in, the, in the second half of the 1800s. Um, from a U.S. perspective, uh, that trade that we just talked about from the, remember we said the U.S. had their, their Hong right here, it's called the old China trade. Okay, that's the friendly trade between the US and China that went on for a hundred something years. And especially uh, in the New England colonies, because remember when we said New England was big ships and, and you know uh, shipbuilding and all that stuff, they were good at that. So a lot of people from Massachusetts would sail to China, believe it or not, and uh, do that trade. So this was the American Hong. Um, and all this was going very well. They would buy stuff like this. This is like a big sewing box. You see all the intricate, you know, handwork there and these Chinese vases and porcelain and all this. These are the kinds of things that they were, they were buying. You can still see these in museums in America. They have lots of museums which have all the stuff that the Americans bought from China in the old China trade. Okay, they went there for a long time. Okay, so it's very interesting. Now, what we're going to see next time Next, our last class is going to be how all these colonies came to an end. And, and from the China perspective, we're going to see how the old China trade came to an end. Um, and what we're going to see next time is revolutions, how a lot of the colonies had revolutions and then threw off the colonizers and then became independent countries. Um, and with the China case, we'll see how the uh, foreigners tried, basically had wars, the opium wars, to try to change the system so that they would have more ability to uh, be more in control of trade. Because we say at this time, China is totally in control of everything about trade. And the Europeans want to change that. Okay? That's after they do that through these opium wars with China. All right? That will be our next class. So uh, I'll see you guys. We went over a little bit. We had a lot of stuff. I promise next time we won't go over. You'll be right on time. Okay? Have a good week, and I will see you on Wednesday. Bye.